Chapter Seven of Aunt Jane's Nieces in the Red Cross by L. Frank Bow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Seven on the Firing Line. Next morning they were all wakened at an early hour by the roar of artillery, dimly heard in the distance. The party aboard the Arabella quickly assembled on deck, where little Maury was found leaning over the rail. They're at it he remarked wagging his head the germans are at newport now and some of them are over against the pervis i hear sounds from demute too the rattle of machine guns it will be a grand battle this i wonder if our albert is there who is he asked patsy the king they told me yesterday he had escaped we must get the ambulances out at once said beth i'll attend to that replied uncle john partaking of the general excitement warp up to the dock captain carg and i'll get some of those men to help us swing the cars over the side how about a chauffeur asked dr geese who was already bringing out bandages and supplies for the ambulances if we can't find a man i'll drive you myself declared ajo but you don't know the country geese turned to the little belgian can't you find us a driver he asked we want a steady, competent man to run our ambulance. Where are you going? asked Maury. To the firing line. Good. I will drive you myself. You? Do you understand a car? I am an expert, monsieur. A waiter in a restaurant? Pah! That was five years ago. I will show you. I can drive any car ever made, and I know every inch of the way. Then you're our man, exclaimed Mr. Merrick, much relieved. As the yacht swung slowly alongside the dock, the Belgian said, While you get ready, I will go ashore for news. When I come back, very quick, then I will know everything. Before he ran down the ladder, Patsy clasped around his arm a band wearing the insignia of the Red Cross. He watched her approvingly, with little amused chuckles, and then quickly disappeared in the direction of the town. He doesn't seem injured in the least by his accident, said the girl, looking after him as he darted along. No, returned Geese. He is one of those fellows who must be ripped to pieces before they can feel anything. But let us thank heaven he can drive a car. Mr. Merrick had no difficulty in getting all the assistance required to load the two ambulances to the dock. They had already been set up and put in order, so the moment they were landed they were ready for use. A few surgical supplies were added by Dr. Geese, and then they looked around for the Belgian. Although scarce an hour had elapsed since he departed, he came running back just as he was needed, puffing a little through haste, his eyes shining with enthusiasm. Albert is there, he cried. The king and his army are at Newport. They will open the dikes and flood all the country but the main road, and then we can hold the enemy in check. They will fight those Germans, but they cannot advance. For we will defend the road and the sand dunes Aren't they fighting now asked Jones? Oh, yes, some of the big guns are spitting But what is that a few will fall but we have yet thousands to face the German horde Let us start at once pleaded Maud Maury began to examine the big ambulance He was spry as a cat in ten minutes He knew all that was under the hood had tested the levers looked at the oil and gasoline supply and started the motor i'll sit beside you and help in a case of emergency said ajo taking his place dr geese dr kelsey and the three girls sat inside patsy had implored uncle john not to go on this preliminary expedition and he had hesitated until the last moment but the temptation was too strong to resist and even as the wheel started to revolve he sprang in and closed the door behind him you are my girls he said and wherever you go i'll tag along maury drove straight into the city and to the north gate jones clanging the bell as they swept along every vehicle gave them the right of way and now and then a cheer greeted the glittering new red cross ambulance which bore above its radiator a tiny fluttering american flag they were not stopped at the gate for although strict orders had been issued to allow no one to leave dunkirk the officer in charge realized the sacred mission of the americans 
and merely doffed his cap in salutation as the car flashed by the road to ferns was fairly clear but as they entered that town they found the streets cluttered with troops military automobiles supply wagons artillery ammunition trucks and bicycles the boy clanged his bell continuously and as if by magic the way opened before the red cross and cheers followed them on their way the eyes of the little belgian were sparkling like jewels his hand on the steering wheel was steady as a rock he drove with skill and judgment just now the road demanded skill for a stream of refugees was coming toward them from newport and a stream of military motors bicycles and wagons with now and then a horseman flowed toward the front a mile or two beyond fern they came upon a wounded soldier one leg bandaged and stained with blood while he hobbled along leaning upon the shoulder of a comrade whose left arm hung helpless Murray drew up sharply and Beth sprang out and approached the soldiers get inside she said in French no replied one smiling we are doing nicely thank you hurry forward for they need you there who dressed your wounds she inquired the Red Cross there are many there hard at work but more are needed hurry forward for some of our boys did not get off as lightly as we she jumped into the ambulance and away it dashed but progress became slower presently the road was broad and high great hillocks of sand the dunes lay between it and the ocean on the other side the water from the opened dikes was already turning the fields into an inland sea in some places it lapped the edges of the embankment that formed the roadway approaching newport they discovered the dunes to be full of soldiers who had dug pits behind the sandy hillocks for protection and in them planted the dog artillery and one or two large machine guns these were trained on the distant line of germans who were also entrenching themselves all along the edge of the village the big guns were in action and there was a constant interchange of shot and shell from both sides as Maury dodged among the houses with the big car a shell descended some two hundred yards to the left of them exploded with a crash and sent a shower of brick and splinters high into the air a little way farther on the ruins of a house completely blocked the street and they were obliged to turn back and seek another passage thus partially skirting the town they at last left the houses behind them and approached the firing line halting scarcely a quarter of a mile distant from the actual conflict as far as the eye could reach from newport to the sea at the left and on towards ypres on the right of them the line of belgians french and british steadily faced the foe close to where they halted the ambulance stood a detachment that had lately retired from the line their places having been taken by reserves one of the officers told mr merrick that they had been facing bullets since daybreak and the men seemed almost exhausted their faces were blackened by dust and powder and their uniforms torn and disordered many stood without caps or coats despite the chill in the air and yet these fellows were laughing together and chatting as pleasantly as children just released from school even those who had wounds made light of their hurts clouds of smoke hovered low in the air the firing was incessant our girls were thrilled by this spectacle as they had never been thrilled before perhaps never might be again while they still kept their seats Maurice started with a sudden jerk made a sharp turn and ran the ambulance across a ridge of solid earth that seemed to be the only one of such character amongst all that waste of sand it brought them somewhat closer to the line but their driver drew up behind a great dune that afforded them considerable protection fifty yards away was another ambulance with its wheels buried to the hubs in the loose sand red cross nurses and men wearing the emblem on their arms and caps were passing here and there assisting the injured with first aid temporarily bandaging heads arms and legs or carrying to the rear upon a stretcher a more seriously injured man most of this corps were french a few were english some were belgian our friends were the only americans on the field uncle john's face was very grave as he alighted in the wake of his girls who paid no attention to the fighting 
but at once ran to assist some of the wounded who came staggering toward the ambulance, some even creeping painfully on hands and knees. In all Mr. Merrick's conceptions of the important mission they had undertaken, nothing like the nature of this desperate conflict had even dawned upon him. He had known that the Red Cross was respected by all belligerents, and that knowledge had led him to feel that his girls would be fairly safe, but never had he counted on spent bullets, stray shells, or the mad rush of a charge. "'Very good,' cried Murray briskly. "'Here we see what no one else can see. The Red Cross is a fine passport to the Grand Stand of War.' "'Come with me, quick!' shouted Ajo, his voice sounding shrill through the din. "'I saw a fellow knocked out. There, over yonder.' As he spoke, he grabbed a stretcher and ran forward, Maury following at his heels. Uncle John saw the smoke swallow them up, saw Beth and Maud each busy with lint, plasters, and bandages, saw Patsy supporting a tall, grizzled warrior who came limping toward the car. Then he turned and saw Dr. Geese crouching low against the protecting sand, his disfigured face working convulsively and every limb trembling as with an ache. End of chapter 7